and welcome to the 495. I'm your host, Doug Sparks, editor-in-chief of Merrimack Valley Magazine. Back from, from my little mini vacation Back up from in the Maine. Yurt. From the yurt. And this time I really went to the yurt because my, my the boss... The yurt looked nice. It, looked, it was very, very yeah. cool. My boss was joking about me being the sort of guy who would go stay in a yurt, and then I actually went and stayed <laughs> in a yurt. And I also did... Uh, you know, like the flotation tank, you know, the sensory deprivation Did sort you? Of tank, the John Lilly, yeah. uh, you know, dolphin guy thing. Uh, that was really interesting. For a parent of young kids, that's a very good time. Yeah. You know, I, I, <laughs> like I did 90 minutes and it probably should have been more like three hours. Is, 90 is, minutes? Yeah, I did 90. Did you um, astro project anywhere? I didn't astro project. <laughs> no, I didn't have any sort of crazy experiences like that. I did lose sense of time and it became like, did you like I oh. when you said ninety minutes? My first thought was, did you feel the ninety minutes? Were you surprised that you were in ninety minutes when it, you get out? There were times when I was like, okay, it's time for this to be over, yep. and then there were times where, you know, it just could have gone on. I was kind of blissed out, and when it when it finally was over, I was like, oh wow, that's ninety minutes. Yep. And there's you know, it's time, so I knew it was. Yep. Uh, you know, but I I enjoyed it. I the, the when I when I went in, the guy recommended that I turn all the lights off. Uh, and I tried that, and I'm usually okay with these sort of things, but that was so dark and so strange. I was like, nope, I'm turning the lights back. Oh, really? Yeah. So I had these low lights, and then this thing where you could make it seem like little stars up inside the flotation tank. I did that for a while. And then over time, I adjusted, and I was like, no, it's, he, he's right. You have, to, you have to take the lights out. Yep. So I took the lights out and, and went uh -huh. into outer space. It was, it was uh, really cool. I'm at, uh, at, at the same time attracted to it and fearful of it. Yeah. I mean, there's different things that, uh, you know, aside from what, you know, whatever you, you may have heard, one of the things that can happen is, is you can get this kind of nice pops in your back because you're so relaxed that things that have been kind of locked up for a while suddenly give way. Yeah. So I had that. I had that where I was just sitting here for a while and my neck went and popped and it was like, oh, suddenly I could kind of move my head in a way I hadn't been yeah. able to move in a while. So that was neat. That was Did you fall it. asleep at all? Uh, I almost fell asleep, yeah. but I told myself I wouldn't. And the, actually, he said something interesting to me. He said, normally I wouldn't say this, the guy who owns the, the wellness center there. Yeah. Normally I wouldn't say this, because, but because of 2020 and COVID, this is happening all the time now because people need self-care, yeah. right? Is they're falling asleep in the flotation tank. Never used to happen. Happens all the time now. So what happens is you fall asleep and you're in darkness and you lose sense. And then it goes into this like cleaning mode when your time is up and you start getting hit with jets and the lights come on and everything. So he's like, oh, if you do fall asleep and you suddenly feel yourself getting hit by these jets, yep. just understand everything's okay. Yep. We're just at the end of the session. All right. So there was one, I think I started to drift and I almost felt like, oh, wait a minute. Is those, is that the jets coming on? But no, I was, I was <laughs> only halfway in. Uh, the new holiday issue of Merrimack Valley uh, a magazine just came out yep. and there's a lot of great stuff in here. Paul Marion's article about, uh, Lowell is is really interesting. My little uh, article about my my walk with the senators in there. There's a lot of good stuff, so make sure you pick this up. Um, I think it's fitting, given this this season, that our guests are are brewers of mead. Uh, you know, my own experience with, and I'll introduce them in a second. My own experience with mead is is kind of interesting because I was always, even when I was young, as I was interested in in the new. You know, things are a yeah. little bit different, or things are a little bit unusual. And I spent a semester in England as an undergrad, and I went to Canterbury, and I liked Chaucer, and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna get some mead. And we went all over thinking I was gonna be like really cool and get some mead and drink it walking around the streets of Canterbury. Uh, and the only thing they had at the time was this super sweet, syrupy, you can still buy this stuff, I'm not gonna say the name of the brand, but there's this like international brand of this yeah. stuff that basically tastes like cough syrup, but wasn't good. Um, and I had, I, you know, I, I, it was my first time having it. Yep. I figured, well, that's what meat is, and, and there you go. So it wasn't like I had, you know, uh, my palate was okay for, for whatever I was, yep. 19, 20 years old. Uh, but it didn't make me crave the stuff when I, when I came back, for sure. Uh, that has begun to change because the, the uh, sophistication of people making meat uh, has completely changed. And we're going to talk about that right now. So my guests today are from House Bear Brewing in Newburyport. Uh, I have Beth uh, uh, Borges and Carl Hirschfeld on the show with me today. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? Hey, so uh, everybody's listening and they're saying they're talking about mead. Uh, can, you, can you tell everybody, what is mead? Mead is alcohol made from honey. So whenever you're making alcohol, you're always fermenting the sugars from something, which means the yeast eats sugar to make alcohol. And with beer, the yeast are eating the sugars from grains. Wine, the yeast eats the sugar from grapes. With mead, the yeast are eating the sugars from honey. Okay. And that 
where the alcohol is coming from. Okay. And so, like, what's the appeal to you of, of mead? How do you get into this? Why this uh, instead when, of beer or something else? I was always the shy kid that had a bunch of guy friends growing up. and But my older brother is quite a bit older than me. And when I was in grade school, he taught me how to play poker. Or at least, you know, I, as much as you can learn it in, you know, when you're in fifth grade or sixth grade or something. And the boys didn't like when I beat them. And, uh, and I was like, come on, we're just, we're just having fun here. And then in junior high, when I got an Atari, I know I'm dating myself here, but when I got an Atari, everyone in the neighborhood would come over to play and they didn't like when I beat them. I said, but I live here. I play all the time. So when we were in college and we all wanted to learn how to brew, I was like, well, I don't want anyone to feel bad, but I also don't want to learn. I don't want to not learn how to brew because somebody else is going to feel bad because theirs isn't as good as mine. And, um, then friends of mine introduced me to uh, re medieval reenactment groups, uh, SEA, Society of Creative Anachronisms, and mm -hmm. Daggerher. Those are both groups that recreate medieval society. They have, you know, they they dress up, they make swords, they make, uh, you know, the chain mail. And within these groups, they have what's called brewing guilds. And the brewing guilds would make mead. And so when I got introduced to SCA and Dagger and I learned about the brewing guilds and mead, I was like, this is perfect. I can learn how to brew with my friends, but they can make beer and I can make mead. Everyone's got their own thing and everybody's happy. Hmm. So that's how I got into it. Yeah. And, and, you're, and just so everybody know, you, you make these dry, clean tasting, like beautiful, crisp meads. When did, when did, when did you begin to realize, ah, oh, that's the goal? It's not to make this kind of syrupy thing. Or like, like, did you have an idea? Did you have a vision at the outset as you started doing this that I want something that's going to be dry It, it was clean? sort of an evolution for Carl and I. We were trying to figure out what sets us different, sets us apart from other meaderies. And we kept saying, you know, things that probably everyone else is saying, oh, we've got this great flavors and we've got this and that and the other. It wasn't until we kept hearing from people uh that and you know, people kept saying oh i don't like meat it's too sweet and we're like that's it they don't know it doesn't have to be sweet they've either ha had a very sweet mead like the brand that we won't name right or heard right. the word honey <laughs> and uh and they um they think all meat is made the same so that's when carl and i said and, and for me i actually didn't really like meat i had tried it back in the mid 90s and the only way i found it palatable was to cut it with a pumpkin beer hmm. and more you know 20 million pumpkin beers at the time. So the sweetness of the mead and the pumpkin went really well together. But mead to me was just like you were saying, this thick, heavy, syrupy, sugar crash kind of thing. And the, the meads that Beth had been making were crisp, dry, light, a little more of like, uh, I don't know, the texture of a good cider as opposed to, you know, something you put on your pancakes. <laughs> so that's where I started coming into it. And uh, I came out of the tech field. So coming into the mead business, it was kind of nice going from something in the tech field that changes every day, every minute, your degree you got is out of date by the time you've got a job to jumping into the mead business where once you know how to make good mead, it's been made that way for thousands of years. You can tell anybody for the next thousands of years and you can just start to play around with it and have fun and develop it and really come up with interesting and new sort of creative things. Uh, okay, so speaking of the history, I, I wanted to ask, well, I want to ask a little bit about the history, um, but you, you talked about the Society for Creative Anachronisms and, and, you know, where you were kind of learning this, and this is before Lord of the Rings then, right? This is before... <laughs> Well, suddenly, not the books, but not, but not the books, right? Be, before the, the Peter Jackson films, which is also, right. by the way, before like it was acceptable. I shaved my beard today, but before it was acceptable <laughs> for guys to have beards, uh, and suddenly, uh, you and know, before the, Harry Potter, by the way, too. Yeah, right, right. So, but then you have the Lord of the Rings, and even more recently, you have Game of Thrones, and you have the TV show Vikings. Has that been a boon for you? Has it has it allowed House Bear to exist? Shows like Vikings and Game of Thrones. So it it probably has put mead out there a little bit more and made people more familiar with it so that they actually know what it is before you introduce them to it, hmm. which has been good. But there are some interesting points about that. Like I've, I've definitely heard the Game of Thrones analogy a lot, but then I also heard on forums and I haven't checked this out myself, but I don't think they ever actually mentioned mead or drank mead in the entire series. Yeah. But time and time again, people will come up and say, oh, like Game of Thrones, because yeah. they associate it with, you know, European, old standards and things like that. So yeah, that has helped us on some level, but 
Yeah, even if they don't know what mead is, they go, they associate it, they, they're hearing the word mead more often in popular culture and saying, oh, it's that thing, you know, on Harry Potter or Game of Thrones or something. And they're at least enthusiastic enough to figure out what it is and try it, ask about it, you know, and say, I'll take a home bottle. Yeah. So way, way before the books, uh, Lord of the Rings, where does, where does this start? Where, what's the tradition? Where do we, what do we know about the history of mead? It is the oldest fermented beverage. Hmm. So a lot of people will argue that it's beer or it's wine or something, but consider this. Beer and wine, you, you need an agriculture society for both of them. You need someone to grow the grains and the grapes. Hmm. Mead, you didn't need someone growing anything. You just need anything growing wild, bees to collect the pollen and nectar to make honey, and some caveman to collect the honey. <laughs> Every country has some version of mead, and that's because honey is the only food that won't go bad. So a hunter-gatherer, a caveman who's going hunting and gathering, is going to have a sack made of skins, and he's going to go get honey because if the hunt doesn't go well, he's going to need some food to survive on. It's not like he's got a fridge in the cave. So he's got to go get some honey so that he's got something to live on. So he gets he has a sack made of skins. He goes and gets honey. Maybe he's weeks away from where he's going, you know, going back to. It starts to rain. Without water, hunting won't start fermenting. But once it starts to rain, the wild yeast in the air can start working, and he gets back, and the thing that was a food is now a beverage that makes him feel funny. <laughs> Every country has some version of mead. In Ethiopia, it's called tej. Ireland, Poland are famous for their very sweet meads. Every country has some version of this because of this. Do we know, do we have any sense of what was the first place, or at least in, in terms of the evidence? I think that's a tough one. I think it's not something you can trace back to a specific origin. Right. And it can because it's something that probably happened spontaneously back in the days because you know people didn't know what yeast was. So basically any place where they were having honey, it's possible that they could have had mead at some point. Yeah. They, um, yeah. So that, that, that makes it very hard archaeologically to pin it down. You know, you can do stuff like, you know, there's been honey found in clay pots in, England, in Egypt, but we don't know if that's meat or beer or what it is. It had honey so, in it. Yeah, so it's it's really tricky to put an origin to it, which is what's kind of universal about it. It's just sort of everywhere and nowhere at once. I mean, how does that, it, it, it must make it in some ways like easy to explain what you do for a living. <laughs> I like I, I make the oldest, you know, fermented beverage like it's something like, oh, it's it, it, the, the lineage, like the history is so deep there. I mean, you think even like, you know, I edit and, you know, magazine editor. This is something relatively new to the human experience. And there's a lot of people listening right now who people wouldn't even understand what they were talking about 30 years ago. Like, do you ever have that sense of history and that sense of of these deep, deep roots of what you're doing? I, I yes would, and no. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's one of those interesting ones. Honey is a very expensive fermentable. So throughout the ages, it's always been part of the alcoholic beverage landscape. But it really has been something that's been reserved for people who have the ability to buy it and use it as an alcohol. So I call it the drink of kings and queens and gods and gangsters. <laughs> so it's always been out there. And a lot of times people will get it now. And it's very hard to explain to them because they want to put it into a category. They want to say, is it beer? Is it wine? you'll say, well, no, those are made with grains and grapes. And they'll be like, oh, so is it beer or wine? <laughs> and you're sort of stuck with trying to explain how alcohol is made because alcohol is just everywhere. But the concept of how sugars get turned into alcohol by yeasts eating them isn't quite as known. So it's hard to explain to people when the fermentable is honey, that's when you have mead. I, so. I find it easier for people to understand it when I tell, tell them the <laughs> picture Pac-Man. You've seen the game Pac-Man, right? Oh, yeah. So I always tell them, I was like, the thing that does this, that's yeast. All the balls are sugar. It doesn't matter what kind of alcohol you're making. That's how alcohol works. A, a thing that eats sugar makes alcohol. So, and that's how I explain it. But as far as history, I mean, I, I love what I do and I, I love making mead. Uh, but history is always very relative depending on who's listening or reading about it. You know, I, I had uh, my nieces and nephews at some point looked at my arm and they asked me what that mark on my arm was. And I was trying to figure, I said, you mean the, my, where I got my, sh my inoculations? And they said, yeah, uh, what? I'm like, I look at their arms and they don't have any. I'm like, holy cow, they don't have any. So, hmm. you know, a CD is old to them, you know, let alone a, an eight track tape or a record. So depending on who you're talking to, history could be 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, trying to explain to something that this is not a new thing that came out with Harry Potter, but the oldest fermented beverage is, you know, it's hard to put into perspective for some people who don't really get a sense of the 
grandness of the history book that we were trying to lay out to them. Uh, okay, so something else you mentioned that I wanted to ask you about. Are, are your meads gluten-free? All commercial meads are gluten-free because of the way we're taxed. Okay. Um, and I try to make that distinction. I, in the beginning, I say all meads are, cur- are gluten-free, but then I was like, wait a minute. If they're if someone is home brewing, they can put in whatever they want. The government's not going to stop them. Okay. So- or, or if a winery has got a brewer's license, they can make what's called a bragging. So... No, yeah. oh, then it, it's the brewery that's making it. Yeah, uh, right. So, so, it, so here's a funny thing. There's a, we have a lot of we're probably the most in the most regulated business ever. Um, as a, it, the government considers us for tax reasons only a winery because in the world of the government, for tax reasons, you're either a brewery, a winery, or a distillery. If you don't, if you're not making, if you're not distilling something. If you're distilling something, you're a spirit. If you've got grains, you're a beer. Everything else to the government for tax reasons is wine. So if shrub has alcohol, it's wine. If kombucha has alcohol, it's wine. If cider's a wine. Mead is wine. Everything that doesn't have grains and it isn't distilled is a wine. Hmm. So um, where was I going with this? I forget the... Well, the I mean, I, I, but sort of the reason why I bring it up is I'm just, I'm interested in, like cider, we talked a little bit about craft yeah. cider. Is do you benefit? Is this something else oh. that might spike the interest yes. in in me? So, is that people who are gluten free can drink it safely? Yes, yeah, definitely. So, and I'm sorry, go back to my point. So, because the way we're taxed, we're not a lot of grains on our property or in our meads. Hmm. Now, we can get a a farmer or brewery license and make beer, and it can be in the same facility, but they can't be together. We'd have to have a dividing line. That's the brewery side. This is the winery side, hmm. and we could bring the honey over from the winery side over to the beer side, but we can't bring the grains over to the wine side. Isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah. So, so a commercial meat will always be gluten-free. And yes, that does sometimes help us at farmer's markets or tastings when people are about to pass us by because uh, they look at our bottles and they think, you know, everything in people's minds are either beer or wine. And if it's not in a big, tall bottle with a cork, if it's in a small bottle with a crown cap, then it's definitely beer. So there, people pass us by and they go, oh, sorry, I can't do gluten. I'm like, the perfect. Everything on this table is gluten-free. <laughs> so it, it does definitely draw in a lot of people. A lot more people are asking for that and mm. are, you know, buying for other people who they know are gluten intolerant or whatever. So it, it definitely has helped us, but it's not really a focus. It's not like we're out there saying, hey, buy this because it's gluten-free. We're saying, buy this because it's great. It tastes good. You'll love it. And, oh, it happens to be gluten-free. Sure. So uh, you mentioned that honey is an expensive fermentable. Uh, I'm yeah. just worried about, I, I'm not worried. I'm, I'm wondering... Where do you get your honey? Is it from local farmers? How does that process work? How do you how do you get this stuff? So the honey we get is from Merrimack Valley Apiaries in Billerica, and it's raw local wildflower honey for pretty much everything we do. We do get some other varietal honeys because basically bees forage on certain plants, so you can get a character of the plant in the honey. So there's certain things like orange blossom that you know you're not going to find an orange tree in Massachusetts. So we'll get honey from a couple other sources, but the majority of what we're getting is from Merrimack Valley Apiaries and Bill Ricker. So we're all local unfiltered honey for pretty much everything we do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, and before we get into like the types, because you, you produce different types of mead and I want to hear about that. Mm-hmm. Where does the name come from? House Bear. Go for <laughs> it. So my partner, Carl, is my best friend. Uh, he's a birder. And I don't know if anyone out there knows what that is. Bird watcher. Yeah, bird watcher. Someone with binoculars, a life list, goes and checks out birds and says, ooh, look, a snowy owl or whatever they're called. And yeah, clearly I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not a birder. But, uh, you know, he was hanging out at my apartment one day. We're doing a crossword. And he goes, oh, the house bears outside in, in the bushes outside are really loud. And I'm like, the what? And he kept saying, the house bears outside are really loud. And I kept saying, what? I finally said, Carl, are you saying house bears? He goes, no, there's no such thing as house bears. House sparrows. <laughs> so it became a little <laughs> private joke between us. You know, and we were sort of, I don't know if you've seen the show Family Guy, the dog that walks around on, on his back legs like he's a person and talks and he's really smart. And we sort of pictured a house bear being like that, walking around with a collar or a pair of pants or something. And we always talked about what a house bear likes or doesn't like, what he does and doesn't do. And it was like a little joke. So when we were looking for a name for, you know, our meadery, we were like, why don't we call it house bear? It's very personal. No one else will ever think of it. The and- domain name is still available. <laughs> one that surprised how many things are actually taken when you're coming up with names. You're like, somebody took that? What? Sure. <laughs> For me, it was one of the first choices. And not just that, but, you know, there are so many times where we thought about the idea of bears and honey. You know, Winnie the Pooh and bears like honey and bears and bees. And, you know, like it just seemed to fit. Yeah, yeah. And it, it points to something, too, which I find interesting, which is like if, if people haven't seen a bottle of this stuff, 
Uh-huh. Just have, well, they, maybe they know Vikings and think about, you know, bears in that way. And you're almost expecting the label to be some guy with a giant beard and axe cutting the head off somebody else. And there's a lot of craft beer that's kind of marketed this way, like this kind of yeah. aggressive sort of, but that's not the way you're marketing those products. It's very approachable and kind of fun. And there's, there's a sense of like whimsy. Where do you get the idea of, of where does that come from? Where did you, did, did you decide upon that approach deliberately? And, and where does that come from? Yeah, we definitely get have a lot of fun coming up with names and labels. Beth does all the artwork. Mm-hmm. So one of the fun things we do is we'll sometimes we'll come up with a name first and then put a brew behind it. Sometimes we'll be like, hey, we've got this brew. What do we do with it? Or um, something like our lemonade mead called World War B. That was something that I thought of. I watched Creature Double Feature on Channel 56 in Boston on Saturday afternoons. Right on. And that was something where I love the monster movies. I love that sort of campiness. So for me, the idea was this giant bee from outer space coming to attack, you know, the humans who were taking over the world and pushing the bees out. Um, And then there was also some nods to Futurama and a couple other bee movies in there. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into each label, usually. I'm glad that you said it's approachable because that was very important to us. We wanted to be fun and approachable. We wanted for people to start seeing meat in a very different way. And I like to think of you know, my brain is having been warped by cartoons, you know, the classic stuff, you know, yeah. like Looney Tunes and, and other things. And so we often think about in terms of how does this, what kind of look do we want to represent this flavor and how do, how do we make it feel fun for both us and other people? And so we often have like three panel cartoons. We've got like, you know, World War we've got this sort of a uh, nod to science fiction, B-movie posters. And so we're often going, okay, what do we want to call this? What do we want to, what the label to look like? And so we have a lot of fun. So like nursery crimes is our strawberry basil mead. And we call it nursery crimes because I don't know if you garden, Doug, but when you garden, we do. And when you garden, there's always some critter, some rabbit squirrel or groundhog that treats the yard like its own personal buffet line. It's like they're <laughs> waiting for things to ripen just like you are. The thing you've been waiting for all season. It's like they've got their own watch and go, okay, guys, <laughs> hit it. And then they all go out and take one bite of everything you've been waiting on. Yeah. And you go outside and like the thing that was perfect yesterday now has a big bite missing. And we think of that as a nursery crime, you know, a crime <laughs> against your garden or nursery. And so we have a little three pound of cartoon with a groundhog getting a strawberry and then the perfect strawberry still hanging on the plant with one bite missing. And then the third panel is the gardener bear with a shovel in his hand, finding more theft going, no. <laughs> and so we, we have to go, okay, how do we tell people what's in here visually and have fun with it? And so we want for people to go, this is fun and approachable. This is something I would be interested in picking up off the shelf and trying and investigating, you know? Sure. I think to that to that end with the labels, we always have sort of said we want some. You, you've got to pick up the bottle. You need a reason to pick up the bottle in the first place. Hmm. So the label gets you to look at it, but what's inside the bottle is going to get you to come back because it's just a great beverage, and we're trying to pair those two up. So you see something interesting, you taste something interested, and then you're off and running. So what are some of the other types that you've uh, that you make? Well, we just released Metronome. Hmm. I saw a picture. I haven't tried it yet. Oh, it is a, our first session mead. Uh, it's 6%, lightly carbonated, it's cucumber and melons, and, and some hops. But when I say hops, a lot of beer drinkers are going to think, oh, the super IBU, super bitter. No, we have a limitation of how many hops we can have. We can only have like a pound of hops per thousand gallons. So this is the hops are in there are very subtle. Um, this is sort of like if your spa cucumber water could give you a buzz, or if light beer actually tasted good you know somewhere between those two um it's light dry crisp fun lightly carbonated and on the label we've got a garden gnome laying down against a mushroom with cucumber sliced in his eyes because he's a metro gnome (laughs) and also we, we got four varieties that we have around the clock all year um the first one's called show bear and that comes from a show mead is a mead that's just honey water and yeast hmm. And we're house bear brewing, so we sort of did a little mashup, and it's called Show Bear. It's blueberry blossom honey. That's a straight mead and a great example for somebody who hasn't ever tried mead to start there because it's fermented honey, and it's gold medal winner from the Mazer Cup. That's the world's largest mead competition, so um, that's available year-round. And then in addition to World War B, which is a lemonade mead, and Nursery Crunch is strawberry basil, we also have a passion fruit and prickly pear mead, which is called Paradise Unpaved. That one's very fruity, tropical, beachy kind of drink. And that sort of rounds out our core four. And then we've got other varietals and 
experimental. So. Yeah, we got Wear Bear, which is a sour cider mead blend, not a sizer. Some people call it a sizer. Sizers when you ferment the cider and mead together. <clears throat> These are separate fermentations. And then we've got a Demonic Presence, which is our chocolate hot pepper. Uh, and we and one produce... I desperately need to try. I haven't yet because it, it's like if, <laughs> if any of them are calling for me, it's that one. Uh, <laughs> well, the soon. other thing that we do, which is, again, very different than most of the other meads out there, is we wanted to do something savory. Hmm. So we decided to do a Bloody Mary mead. Hmm. And tomatoes have a lot of alcohol-soluble flavors that you just don't get until you have alcohol and tomatoes coming together. So we decided to do that. We did it with um, heirloom tomatoes, horseradish, peppercorn, celery seeds, a little bit of hot pepper. And that lime was a very, juice. yeah, lime juice. Um, very interesting brew in that, again, most meads out there tend to have that sweetness that you're looking for. And we really sort of wanted to push the limits, find out what we could do, how we could expand our own fun and everybody else's and get people thinking about it in a much different way than, you know, medieval England. And it tastes like a Bloody Mary, but we wrapped it and then we filled it four levels deep. So the, that beverage that start off as thick and really orangey red became very light and clear. It's the clearest mead we have. So it looks like you're holding a glass of wine, but it tastes like a Bloody Mary. It weirds mm. people out with the first time they have it. <laughs> and the, and so I, I always tell people, if it bothers you to look at it, you can close your eyes while you're drinking it because they, they're enjoying the flavor, but it just it's weird for them to see it as a clear, light beverage. Um, but if, for me, it solves a, a big problem because I don't know about you. I love Bloody Marys. And I go out to brunch and I order the Bloody Mary and I'm waiting for the food. And then I finish a Bloody Mary and I decide to have another one because it's so good. And then I finish that and then the food comes and I'm too full to eat. Yeah. And it's like I'm all boozed up and there's no food. So this leaves you room for the food. <laughs> sure. So I live in Chelmsford and I know, I think starting this week, and I don't know, I'm pretty sure, uh, Maxwell starts their farmer's market. And yes. And you have, you're, you're selling the stuff in Maxwell. So people in the Chelmsford area. Yeah, we, we are not going to be there opening day, which is a Saturday. We will be there the following Saturday and every week after that. Okay. Uh, and I also know I can pick it up. Every other week. Sorry, every other week. Every other week. Every week. Okay. Um, and if people want to know if you're kind of driving your car, you can, you can go to your uh, Facebook page, Instagram, uh, yep. Twitter. You're on social media. You can go to the webpage and find out more about where you guys are going to be. I also know I can pick it up at my local liquor store, Drum Hill Liquors in Drum Hill. They stock it. Uh, where are some other places where people can get this if they're if they're listening and they really want to go out and, and yes, grab a few Lincoln bottles? Liquors in Chelmsford there also has it. Hmm. Uh, Wedman's in Burlington has got our stuff. We've got the Concord Cheese Shop. Um, anything else coming up? I would say, let's start with the chain. So Yankee Spirits, Lincoln Liquors, Liquor Junction, Wegmans. Uh, places like that. Then we're in a bunch of small stores as well, but we do list it on our website um, under where to find us. Uh, we list it by city. Um, and so, you know, if you were, say, in Burlington, you could find it at, you know, Burlington Wine and Spirits. If you were in Chelmsford, you could find it at Drum Hill. You know, there's, so we're in about 140 stores across the state. Uh, we're also going to be at the Maxwell's Farmers Market, which you mentioned. We'll also be in the Wayland Farmer's Market this winter. Hmm. Uh, you can order it on Vino Shipper. So if anybody's tuning in from out of state, um, Vino Shipper allows us to ship to about 30 different states where the alcohol laws permit us to ship it out. Um, you can also have it shipped within state too if you want to, but we would suggest find it at your liquor store first, the easier than paying the shipping charges. Oh, well, I was going to mention if people wanted to order online for you know delivery within Massachusetts or you know just to pick up, um, we, we do have a... A website that you can go to to order online. It's housebearbrewing.square.site. And, you know, it's from the square that, you know, the online merchant services. And they that means you can buy our masks, our sanitizer, our mead, our t-shirts, our, our branded glassware, our ciders. We have some ciders that we, we're releasing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Marianne is our uh, pineapple cider. Um, so we are available What's online. Called, as well. What's the, the pineapple cider called? Marianne. And the name comes from what? I'm sorry, what did you say? What The name comes from what? The Gilligan's Island. Oh, okay. So, so it really is the, the only Marianne I would ever think of. <laughs> Why? Uh, pineapples on the island. We thought it'd be kind ah. of fun. And we like Gilligan's Island. And we thought, well, okay, this is a little different. And, you know, ginger is obviously an obvious flavor. And we just thought it'd be kind of fun. I mean, I don't know if you've ever watched Gilligan's Island, but they have a whole bunch of food on the island that really shouldn't be growing on the island. <laughs> shouldn't be there. Like, you know, beets. They have 
Uh, Gilligan has radioactive carrots and beets. Don't know why, but he does. <laughs> so I was like, we could do a flavor. You know, one of the characters could do like, it could be Thurston's, you know, Gilligan's or Thurston's carrots and beets. Because, you know, I think Mrs. Thurston's favorite vegetable is a beet and Gilligan made them radioactive. So we're like, hmm. So, so we've got options. This is now I I have seen Gilligan's Island, but it's it's been a while. I don't remember all this. <laughs> you're you're not just scholars of of uh, beverage history, but scholars of pop culture. Apparently, I remember the coconut radio. I don't remember. Yeah, I, I vaguely remember that. I remember I and you know I was I was a young uh, boy. I remember Ginger and Marianne, for sure. <laughs> so one more question. Um, uh, you know, before I turn this over to Lou, because Lou always has some some great questions for our okay. guests. We're heading into the winter. Yep. Uh, and I noticed on your social media that you were, uh, you know, kind of playing around with some like winter or seasonal fall cocktails. So do you end up playing a lot with these and, and kind of mixing them with different things and playing yep. around with the, the flavors that way? And what can you recommend? Um, well, um, there are a lot of great things to do, especially with World War B. World War B is our lemonade mead, which mixes nice with bourbon and a splash of lemon juice. Mm. Uh, it mixes nice with vodka and ginger beer to make a Moscow mule. So if you like Moscow mules, um, that's a good thing to do. Also, if you like tea, you can have a cold tea with it and make it have an Arnold Palmer, or you can mix with a hot tea and lemon juice for a hot toddy. Hmm. So boom, there are four drinks right there just with the lemonade meat. And we also have the same thing with Paradise and Paved and Nurture Crimes. Paradise and Paved mixes nicely with rum, tequila, or mezcal. So that's always fun to, you know, bring back a little bit of summer in the middle of your winter and, you know, I, I actually recently had the Paradise Unpaved with uh, a nice smoky mezcal and some ginger simple syrup, and mm. that was a great combination. That's what I what I would put with a barbecue sauce kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, and it it's, uh, sounds fantastic for a, a colder day. Although I guess the weather's heating up. Uh, I, I heard we might get into the seventies this relatively. Weekend. So, uh, Lou, do you have any questions for our guests? Yeah, well, actually, I stopped listening at Bourbon. When, when <laughs> she, <laughs> his eyes glazed bourbon. over for a second uh, there. Well, I, I want to start with you guys were talking about all the places you can get your uh, get the mead, and I happen to live in Newburyport, and you left us out. We're close to home, where can we get? Um, our tasting room is going to be open for bottle sales coming up soon. We've been relatively shut down because of that, uh, because of the COVID situation. So we'll be open for bottle sales probably on Thursdays and Fridays. We'll, yeah. we, haven't, we haven't ironed that out yet. But yeah. in addition, we are available at three stores in Newbury, uh, Plum Island Provisions, oh. the Cottage oh. Island Market, and the cupboard, Corner Cupboard. And in Amesbury, at what used to be CBC Amesbury, but I think it's now RMC Craft. So okay. we're at those places. In addition to our tasting room, we're going to be posting our, our new uh, bottle sales or pickup window hours pretty soon. All right. I live on the island, so I'll stop at Plum Island Provisions on the way home and pick something up. If everything, you know, eases up, we'll be able to get people back in to do tastings at the tasting room again, do flights, do some more sample stuff and see how it's perceived. And then you get all the good stuff back out to the world. Post mask era, I guess. Uh, help me acclimate a little bit. Which mead would I start with, and when do I drink it? Is this a with meal type of drink? And I, I wanted to get into cocktails a little bit. You guys get into it a little bit, but is this a, a with a meal type of drink? Is this a uh, sitting on the back deck type of, type of drink after dinner? Yes. Yeah. Yes, all of that. All of that. <laughs> um, it's light and dry and crisp, so you can absolutely positively have it on your own. Um, it is not one of those thick, sweet things that you have to have with dessert. So you can have it on ice or cold or room temperature, whatever way you want, on your back deck with nothing. Or you can certainly pair it with your favorite dishes. We do have food and cheese spring suggestions for all of our meads. Um, and and I've, we have that listed on our website. But you don't have to have it with a meal. This is not wine. And when I have when I offer people food and cheese spring suggestions, people often say, so like with like like wine. I say, well or beer or cider or anything else because you probably have something to drink while you're eating and something to eat while you're drinking. So we try to make it easier for people by having food and cheese drink suggestions, but you don't have to have it just with your meal. You could have it watching a movie or playing ping pong or hanging out with your friends in the back deck. Yeah, or, so the nice thing about meat is there's no protocol to it. We're always telling people experiment with it, find out how you like it. And we've actually had some really great suggestions come back to us. We had a woman pick up the nursery crimes, which is a strawberry basil, and she put it in her spaghetti sauce, oh. which is a great idea. You've got the sweetness of the strawberries, cutting the acidity of the tomatoes, and you have the basil note that ties in. So there's, it's, it's something that's really easy to be creative with. Right. And we always say drink it straight first, because if you like it, you don't have to play around with it, right. but you certainly can. Which, me, which mead would I start with? Recipes? 
I'm sorry. Uh, which mead would I start with of yours? I would start with Chauvert. It is a traditional mead. And what that means is that it's only honey water yeast. Now, all mead starts with honey water yeast. That is the basis for all meads. However, as brewers, if we don't add it into the honey water yeast, it's called a traditional mead. So when someone says traditional mead, that the only thing they mean is it's got only three ingredients, honey water and yeast. It doesn't mean anything else. And that's a great place to start because then you're getting the basis of, you know, that meadery's lineup that is the ba basic recipe um and it's when i say basic i don't mean like basic like oh you are so basic i would just mean <laughs> you know you can't get more simple than that but the it has a lot of complex flavor flavors in there because there are so many things that are going on in the pollen and nectar in the honey that so when you have a traditional mead you're getting a lot of good complex flavors that come from the blossom you know from the blueberry blossom the orange blossom the apple blossom whatever blossom the bee has gotten the pollen nectar from there's so many there's so, so much complexity in that honey it's really great once you have that then i would tr go out and try some of the other flavors that you might be interested in what percentage of alcohol do they sit in about well m meads can be anywhere from uh six percent to twenty percent our most of ours are ten to twelve percent however we have just released some six percents uh so if you're looking for a, a nice you know lower alcohol mead we we have some coming out we've got metronome we just released we're going to be releasing mead love which is t uh cherry tangerine and coconut milk also lightly carbonated um and that's a nod to my favorite author harlan ellison so um he had a book called the beast that shouted love at the world so the original name of this was the bear that shouted mead love at the world but it was kind of <laughs> long so we just shortened it to mead love and we have on the label the bear that shouted and then you can see a bear with a little dialogue bubble saying mead love and you know so if you look at the label and you know harlan Nelson, you'll get it but if you don't someone will go huh well that's interesting <laughs> Uh, with the hot toddy and the cooking with it, it sounds like it stands up the heat really well. So there, can you give us some other cooking options or some other warm drink options? That's a good question. Um, it definitely does stand up to heat. Meat is one of those things that it's been done mold in different cultures. So doing something like uh, a spice packet with it was, say, like cloves and cinnamon and things like that and then steeping it. Um, definitely makes for a good mulled mead, the way you would say a mulled cider or a mulled wine. And I have some recipes for that on our social media. Um, if you wanted to make it easy, you can mix our mead with uh, a cider orange juice and and then uh, a spice mix from Salina Garden Farm called Ruby Rose, which has got a really nice combination of spices. It's, it's a, a tea blend, actually. I'm sorry, what did I say? You said just spices. So it's, yeah. it's a tea blend that right. you're looking for. Mm. Right, but it's it's got the the flavors that will give you a nice mold mead flavor. But in addition, you can there's so many things. I had someone who used our strawberry basil in their salad dressing, so you don't have to cook with it with heat, but you can. Um, you know, you put in your spaghetti sauce, you could put in your salad dressing. Anywhere you can use, anytime you're cooking, you can always add alcohol. A lot of people will add beer to their stews or wine to their sauces. You can do the same thing with mead. Um, it'll cook off the alcohol, but it will still impart the essential flavors of that beverage into your food. So uh, yeah. sometimes I will add uh, the passion fruit and prickly pear to my pan after I've made meat to deglaze. And so it'll grab the meat flavors, the mead flavors, and it'll just, you know, it's kind of a nice thing to add to the side of your plate. Yeah, it, on uh, Memorial Day, I, I went to Drumhead Liquors and I, I bought everything. I bought all the meads they had from, from you guys. Okay. And then we went full Viking. We, we had elk <laughs> and boar, and we just did a bunch of game meats, and uh, it paired wonderfully. To me, I, I guess I'm a little bit of a purist because I just think, oh, why would you put this in food? Like, this stuff is good. Like, drink it. Like, just, it, it, is, it is good. It's perfect the way it is. Don't put yeah. it in the spaghetti sauce. But, of course, it's nice to, to experiment and, and get creative, and that's where the ideas come from. Yeah, I think that's where we're sort of bringing it forward. You know, it's it's sort of standardly been this, you know, beverage of just fermented honey. And we're sort of bringing it in line with more of the craft beer market and the playing around with the flavors and things like that. But I think what you just said is is a great statement. It's it's great by itself. And in fact, the show bear mead that we made with blueberry blossom honey did so well that we actually turned it into a series of meads where we took different varieties of honey and used the exact same recipe. Mm. So you can actually see how the flower that the bees are foraging on implants flavor into the honey that comes out in the final brew, which is kind of an interesting thing. So we released the same recipe as an orange blossom, a cranberry blossom, a butterbean blossom, and a Christmas berry. And it's really delicious. 
Um, but the reason why we have Metail recipes and, and uh, uh, food and cheese pairing suggestions and and tell people how they can actually add it to their cooking is because we don't want for people to get stuck in the world of wine where there are all these rules this is chilled this mm -hmm. isn't this is how you these are all things you have to do to be a good mead drinker like you know you would a wine drinker it's like no no there are no rules in the mead world in wine maybe but in mead it not so much you know when people say what temperature they serve it at I always tell them at room temperature you can taste the nuance of the flavors more however I'm a craft beverage gal I tend to chill everything I always tell people try both of and see how you like it because you're not me and this is not a world that has rules. So have it the way you want. If you want to throw in two ice cubes, throw in two ice cubes. So that's part of the reason why we have meat tail recipes, food and cheese pairing suggestions, tell people they can cook with it because we want for people to feel free to experiment because this is all about what kind of sticks and, tigs, sticks and twigs do you want to put into your drink, not what are the rules I have to follow? This is about experimentation and fun and seeing how mead fits into your life, not how you fit into the world of mead. Yeah. And, uh, and, it fits into your life. And I want to pick up on something Lou said too, because he mentioned the, the alcohol content. One of the things I like about mead, and I think it worked perfectly at this party because uh, you know we're adults now and people have to drive and go home, is I, I don't, f I, I, I feel like the, the alcohol content is enough to um, you know enliven conversation but not enough where you're like, oh, geez, why did I do? How I'm foolish can I be, that. right? Uh, yeah, it, it was like the, the right amount, you know, and it's like, that, that's what it felt like, the right amount. It felt balanced. Yeah, it's like, this is this delicious are. thing, and I don't feel like an idiot afterwards. You know what I mean? <laughs> there have often been higher alcohol, 14, 16, 18, 20%. We felt that 10 and 12% were a good range to be in for our basic four you know, core four meads because, you know, big beers, higher alcohol beers are eight and a half and up. Wines at 12 to 14. So our meads right now are on the high end of a big beer, on the low end of wine. If you drink either of those, this is still in your wheelhouse. It's not going to stop you from living your life or doing things, hanging with your friends, playing a board game, watching a movie, having coherent speech. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, has just enough alcohol to be fun and give you a buzz, but not so much that, you know, you're not being able to function. Sure. So, I'm glad you felt feels the right amount. Yeah, yeah. For me, for me, perfect. And I think my guests uh, felt the same way because there was not any left at the end of the evening. <laughs> okay. You know, it Yay. was it was enjoyed not just by me but by everyone there, and it was a it was a really great experience. So our guests this week were uh, Beth Borges and Carl Hirschfeld from House Bear Brewing in Newburyport. Go to their social media page, go to their webpage, and check them out. Maybe I'll see you guys at Maxwell's sometime soon in in two weeks. Yeah. I'll stop by Can and I say hi. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, please. I, people often ask where they can find us in stores, and I always tell them. However, I'd like to add that um, sometimes stores move things around. Sometimes they sell out. Sometimes we're not at the store someone frequents. So we always tell people when you go into a store, requ either ask for us by name so that you know they know you're looking for us. If they don't have us, request us, because that is the best way for a store to know that you're looking for us. If you look for meat in general, ask for meat. If you look for us, ask for house bear brewing. A lot of stores assume that if you don't ask for something, they have everything you want. And a lot of customers assume that if it's not on the shelf, they can't get it, which isn't true. And so we're trying to educate consumers by letting them know you have to ask for what you want. Let them know you're looking for it. And if they know you want it, they will get it. Or That's they will point you to where it is in the shelf. That sounds great. And it sounds like a great way to end the show. So thank you very much, Beth and Carl. I really, really appreciate you coming on the 495. And I'm going to see everybody next week. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye.